Um, turn with me to Genesis chapter number three. Our, our, most of us know, um, most of us know the Genesis chapter number two passage of scripture where God makes man and he makes female and the two of them are distinctly different. And then I told you last week, if you weren't here, th there's uniquely a difference because the old, the New Testament, as it relates to principles about relationships, was written by someone who was single. The Apostle Paul was deemed to be someone who was single or divorced when he became a Christian. And then the other passages of scripture that we have written about a person that was in relationships is a man that had 700 concubines and 300 wives. So we don't really have a passage of scripture written by a true couple as it relates to being husband and wife um, on how it is to be relatable in relationships. And so this morning, um, I'm going to make it applicable not just for relational couples, but also singles and those that are dating. And tonight they have, um, if you are of Creole, Haitian descent, they have uh, a relationship panel that I think will be very fun and informative and so you can still make the park and back on time for Creole and all that good stuff. So Genesis chapter number three and it reads interestingly enough in the NIV it reads this way verse 16 this is after the fruit has been eaten um, Adam has some sense of communication with Eve to find out that hey you, you've eaten of this forbidden fruit and all of a sudden they get addressed by God and God says why did you do this he gives his rationale and his reasoning and it's not really acceptable and then Genesis 3 is where God pronounces this curse over man and over women and he says to the woman he said I'll make your pains and childbearing very severe this is to assume that before Adam and Eve's transgression, there was no pain in having children. Let the church say amen. So with painful labor, you will give birth to your children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. He will rule over you. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate the fruit about the tree, which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it. So a lot of us who are working hard and working really, really hard and working, working really, really hard and working, working really, really hard, that, that is a result of the curse of the ground. We're working extra hard to sometimes get average results. I can't hear nobody in the quiet church. Y'all had a long Valentine's Day weekend? All right, wake up. Praise the Lord. So, so <laughs> I, I mean, this, is, this curse has happened because Adam and Eve's decision, we're not saying it's one person's, it's both parties' decision, it has now affected the way that we operate in our day-to-day -day lives. We work harder. We are toiling. We are laboring because of it. And it says, verse 18, it will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat food until you return to the ground, since, since from it you were taken, and dust you are, and dust you will return. So in essence, God is promising us that you'll work hard every day of your life until you die. So this is where we get the idea when people die, we say from labor to reward. Because you and I are going to work like mad people until we die. Get that through our hearts and get it through our heads. Like the comedian would say, let it sizzle in your spirit. Right? So this, this, this is what's going to happen. We are going to work and we're going to work hard. And here's what it says. I'm going to put enmity between the man and the woman. And, and it says in verse 16 around there that the husband and wife are going to be challenged because the
the husband is going to rule over that's part of the curse is that the husband's going to rule over the wife and so can you imagine two people get together and now they're in relationships now and they're challenged because they're always butting heads because here's what you got to realize whenever someone says they want to get married that is an automatic sign to Satan to say please attack us because marriage is the only thing that reflects the institution of the church so just as Satan fights the church he also fights relationships because that is the only thing in the earth that is a mirror reflection of God's true intention for humanity. So you ever wonder, so when you are in a relationship, you're not only facing natural challenges, if you're spiritual, you're facing spiritual challenges because Satan does not want us to engage in healthy, now let me pause and say this, Satan does not care that you and I get married as long as it's not healthy. Because if it's not healthy, it will control your day. If it's not a good situation, then it will control. And the way that Satan ruins a lot of our single lives is he knows a lot of us are so determined to be with someone that he just sends someone into our lives that looks good but isn't good and the only assignment is to detour you from purpose. so here it is I want to talk about a few things that I think are important so Adam and Eve get kicked out the garden they get walked out of the garden because of their sins and they're no longer allowed to come back and so much so that they're no longer allowed to come back God puts an angel there to say listen I've evicted you and I don't want you to come back at all so imagine how this couple has to feel imagine the blame game that might be happening in between them you cost us this house if you didn't do this, we wouldn't be in this position. And then they raise children that end up killing each other. One kills the other. So you see this dysfunctional family throughout, scripture doesn't hide dysfunction in family because that's part of the curse. Have you ever seen some family members that are just like, we related by blood, but we can't be related. You understand, we got that one family member we thinking about right now. Like we love them, but we're like, the curse hit you. It just, it just, it hit you, right? So here's the thing. So in this process, we were talking about last week, the five emotional needs of, of, of the top 10, the 10 emotional needs of his or her. And so I want to kind of run through, if y'all can give me my time so I don't talk too long. Um, I want to give you the top five, generally speaking, that matter. And I asked couples last week to go through what was most important to you. Now, this list doesn't mean that it applies to you because some of us are different. But as a general consensus, this applies to most. And if you are single, I said, you need to know what your value systems are today, even though they may not be the same tomorrow, but you need to know what you value the most because a lot of us are deficient in one area and when one person meets that area, we fall head over heels because they're meeting an area of deficiency, not because we really like you, you're just meeting a need. So it's very important. So here's five, and I'm, I'm probably gonna have my wife talk about the women's section so y'all don't say I'm sexist and, and talk about it wrong. But I wanna give you the top five and she can run through them. Um, number one for a lady is affection. Number two is con generally. Number two is conversation. Number three is honesty and openness. Number four is financial support. Number five is family commitment. So I'm going to have my wife run through these. And then for a male, as she's coming, I'm going to talk about these five. Um, number one for a male is sexual fulfillment. Number two is re recreational companionship. Number three is physical attractiveness. And number four is domestic support. Number five is admiration. Remember, the word is generally. Doesn't mean that's you, but it means generally. And so I wanna kinda help you see how a, a female phrases it in her thinking and a male phrases it in hers. All right. So the top five for the, the ladies. When I look at these top five, especially affection and conversation, 
it goes back to when I think of this word empathy. When I look at the word empathy, it's like it's the psychological identification with or vicariously experiencing of the feelings or thoughts or attitudes of another. So you are pretty much feeling, going into my shoes. Like if I care about certain things or I'm feeling a certain way, he's literally trying to be, think about how I'm thinking and how I might be feeling. It shows appreciation. So when I feel affection, I feel appreciated. I feel compassion. I feel like he has an insight or he comprehends what's going on within me. Now we know men and women are two different worlds. So with him trying to guess how I feel is not always going to work because he may get it wrong. So another thing when we say about affection conversation, that open and honestness. Now, for me, it's important to be open and honest on how I'm feeling. Because sometimes we want to suppress that and be like, ah, oh, he won't understand, or we just let it, it's just too much work to try to express yourself, or this is what I'm really thinking, this is what I'm really feeling. Well, in a marriage, the goal of a marriage is to remain lifelong partners, right? So the thing is, sometimes we confuse marriage with a contract. A contract is a business deal. Like, okay, as long as I'm doing my part and you're doing your part, we're good, right? We're, we, we, could, we could work together. But marriage is not a contract, it's a covenant. It's a covenant between us two where even though I lack and even though I have faults and even though I fail and you fail, we're in this together and we're gonna see it through together till the end. So when we get that mindset, is, is, this is not a contract, this is if you do this and I'll do that, that we're in this together, then we can be more empathetic towards each other. And then he can fill my affections and what I need and he can fulfill those needs because we're ultimately complementing each other. We're not going to be that completeness for each other, but that complimentation, right? I'm complimenting you, you're complimenting me. And I like, I like the word that she used there, she doesn't complete me, I don't complete her. We complement each other. And if you're looking for someone to complete you, only a savior can complete you. Right? So a lot of times we have expectations that we originally went into our relationships with that are never going to be met because only a savior can complete us. And that's so important because a lot of times we get married like, oh, he's going to be everything for me. She's going to be everything for me. And then five, seven years, we're walking around with this silent dissatisfaction because they didn't meet that need because they were never created to meet that need. So with affection, it's, it's more than just, you know, us touching each other and saying, you know, I love you. Yes, I love you. I care for you. You show that towards your action and being there for one another. With conversation, what really worked for me is James 1 verse 19. What we all know is be slow to speak, right? Quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to be angry. Because oftentimes when we're trying to have a good conversation or when we're being open with each other, and there are some things that the truth comes out and the truth sometimes hurt. And you might not want to hear it, but you need to hear it. Because oftentimes without knowing the truth or hearing the truth, how will we grow? How will we grow in our marriage? How will we know each other? So in conversation, always thinking about how to be quick to listen. Listen to the, what your spouse is saying to you. Don't listen with your head only. Listen with your heart so that you can hear where it's coming from. Because if your spouse is trying to come from a good place, you will hear that. And then be slow to speak because sometimes we're just too rushed to have enough, you know, to come back. Like, okay, well, this is why and have a response and have a reason. But I had to learn even in my marriage that I had to be quick to listen, slow to speak. Because when you're slow to speak, that's when you can be slow to become angry because now you're gaining understanding. Okay? So open and honestly, like I said, is very important. It helps us to be secure in our marriage. It helps us to 
if I've done wrong, I need to fess up and say I did wrong. James chapter 5 verse 16 says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Where will healing come if you cannot confess? Where will healing come if we cannot be open with one another? It could be even the little things. It isn't, you don't always have to think of, you know, the major things, infidelity, but even the little things in marriage can really taint your marriage if you can't be open and honest. Financial support is pretty much, you know, supporting each other where we are financially. So I'm going to support him if I know that we can't afford certain things, that I'm not going to nag him and say that I need this thing, I, I want this thing, or make him feel bad for not being able to supply that need. Also, just to, it's very important for him to know that for a woman's perspective or for a husband to know that we need to feel secure like the basic needs are met. You know, because if we are to, you know that you are the head, so the head is in charge and we submit to the head. So as the head of the house, are you making financial decisions that's going to benefit the house and not you alone? And as for me, as a, uh, you know, if I'm a big spender, am I making financial decisions? That's when we always have to come together. It's good to budget together, to know your money, because if you don't know where your money is going, you're always going to be wondering, like, what happened to it. And then lastly, with the five, is family commitment. To be engaged, for me, it's always about being engaged as a family. Yes. Life is always busy, but can we pause for a moment as a family unit to do something together? It could be not only just pausing and saying I'm there, but putting all electronics away, just being in the now. Being in the now means I'm present, I'm listening, I'm eye contact, we're talking, we're having a good time together. It could be as simple as dinner at the table once a week with no electronics and having conversation, or movie night as a family, or, or it could be big as planning one family trip a year. But family commitment is very important for me as a woman because I know that you're there, not just for the two of us, but the children need to see that we're together as a family, we're one unit. Amen? So these, thank you. So these are our, our very important pieces because here for a man to know that as you can see males have a totally different idea on what's important to them and I'm not going to spend too much of time on these but the top five for men are sexual fulfillment at the end of the day uh, they say the average man thinks about sexual thoughts every 120 seconds That's just how God wired us. You know, I, I could be sitting in service and preaching. I'm about to preach, and I'm like, God, yeah, I got to pay attention, right? Because that's how just God wired us. You know, that's how God wired us. And so th this is just, that's as real as it gets, you know, Bible ready, open, and it's like ready to preach God's word. It's like, you look good in them apple bottom jeans, right? So this is, so this is, this, this, this is, this is the thinking pattern of man. Number two, is recreational companionship. So you don't, it's important that you know what's important to him to get in his world. So even if you're dating, it's important to know what each other values. I don't like that, so I'm not gonna get into it. Well, you know what, there may be someone else that does. And that doesn't mean that you gotta be a football fan, a basketball fan, but at least try to get into their world and not just keep it in your world. Number three is this, physical attractiveness, um, you know, I know there are some deep people that says, you know, Pastor, I was praying and her spirit caught my attention. Well, that's, that's great for you. Uh, but the average person is a male needs to be physically attracted. Domestic support, uh, which doesn't mean that I expect you to clean the house and do all that type of stuff. It just simply means that we share these responsibilities and that there's cleanliness and that there's a place that I can come and rest and and have a good space because just because you have a house doesn't mean it's a home. Okay. I always say the a woman is the is the um, temperature of the home. 
she's like the thermostat that sets the temperature in the home. All right, and number five is admiration. You can't tell your spouse about everybody else doing great, but never tell them about anything great they've done. My boy, I tell you, this guy at my job, he's a hero. He's, he's awesome. You, you all right. You all right. Let's go. He's all right. But, but here's where I want to pivot a little bit, and this is why it's important. So I have this picture. I have this picture on the screen, and it's a picture of a clacked, a clack, a cracked <laughs> glass. And I saw this in my home, and I thought it was so amazing because all of us, and they should have the picture up there soon, uh, all of us are a part of this. We all have a crack somewhere. From humanity's fall, we all have a crack. Depending upon how your life has been determines how deep your cracks are. And so if we don't, good, thank you. If, keep it up there for me. If you don't manage this crack properly, you could function. Liquid could still be poured into you, but it slowly starts to leak out of you. And a lot of us, the reason why, like I meet people who are asking, like, Pastor, when am I going to get married? And I know them, and I'm simply internally saying, I hope you don't. Because you're so damaged that you won't even be able to receive love. And here's what happens, is we get two crack people getting together, hoping that you'll be the doctor to my soul. And when you don't fix me, I get more disappointed and more cracked. Or you have the one that's even more spiritual. You're so spiritual that when things are not working relationally, you're saying, well, I'm just going to trust God's going to fix it. No, God needs our participation. Every miracle that happened in Scripture had some human participation. Give me the bread and the loaves. Give me the bread and the fish. I'm going to do the miracle, but I need you to do something that you can do. And all of us, if we were to admit it, we have some type of crack in our lives. The question is, is how do we manage it? Because if we don't manage this properly, an altar is not going to fix it. A first dance with dad is not going to complete it. This is a space and a place that requires us to investigate. And here's the thing. If you are married to someone or you're dating someone that you know is cracked, you can't say to that, oh, you got problems. Well, you married them. And if you married them and they've gotten these, and as we go through life, these cracks come from everywhere. Loss of a loved one. Child miscarriage. Death unexpected. If I know this glass is cracked, I just don't handle it any type of way. And then I'm mad at the glass for leaking when I already knew you were cracked. And because I know you're cracked, now there's different type of glasses. There are some glasses that are not as cracked. There are some that are. But the responsibility is I need to handle you to the level that you are. And if you are more cracked than someone else, I need to know how to manage you accordingly. And not say, well, man, such and such went through what you went through and they're fine. Well, they manage cracks differently. And depends on how much I pour into you on a day-to-day -day, also determines how I feel in the moment. Some seasons are better than other seasons. And if I, you know I got a lot on my plate and I'm already fragile, then that may be a season to cuddle me a little more than you would normally have to. I'm tired of always standing with you. Well, here's the problem. You know I'm cracked. And a lot of us are cracked, and instead of fixing our crack, we're hoping that joining with someone would erase it. 
it doesn't erase it, it magnifies it. That's just the way I am. That's just how I do things. People should not have to pay for your dysfunction. At some point, you should say within yourself, you know, I'm too broken at this stage. And maybe both of us are so broken, it's very hard to fix you when I'm broken. And here's the word that culturally is a curse word. Sometimes we have to man up or woman up and go get help for our cracks. Because a lot of us, God has been pouring out blessings and it keeps leaking everywhere. And in your life, all you see is bodies everywhere. Because everybody that God sends you, we kill because we don't know how to deal with them because we're so cracked. And let me tell you, money does not fix your cracks. It helps you find people to appease it. So you're so broken because you got money, nobody wants to tell you because they know if they tell you, you get put out the circle. And Valentine's Day don't fix it either. It highlights. And some of us are, are just so broken. We, we are so broken that social media has made a profit off of our brokenness. You see some people, they, they, they do outrageous stuff to get virtual attention because they're so broken. You check in every hour, how many people are liking what I put up there? because you're so broken that you don't get real attention, you'll take artificial. And everybody in this room is cracked in some way. The difference is, are you cracked and you're healthy or are you cracked and you're unhealthy? If you're unhealthy, it's a problem. Because it doesn't, and the worst person to give a position to is someone that's cracked whether it be a worship leader, a pastor, whatever, because now the applause is not for God, it's for their brokenness. So this morning, I'm not trying to get you, and those of us that came late, very late this morning, very, very late, very, very, very late, very, 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 very late, praise God, very late. All right, service at 9.30, my God, it's very late. I know Valentine's Day was long, praise God. But, but here's the thing, if we, are, if we are cracked, buying a new car don't fix it. And listen, and, and here's the truth, y'all. Let me, let me, why did I take this down? Do you know how many women have been molested and raped? By uncles and aunties? big brothers, siblings, and you marry them and then you raise your voice at them and then they're, they're toughening up. They're they they ready to fight. Well, you got to understand, that's the glass you married. And I know in the urban church, that's not something we talk about. We just kind of deal with it. Yeah, uncle did it. And you know, I'm just living my life. I'm living my best life. Ain't nothing going to stop me. No, your husband has been paying the price of your uncle. Because when he corrects you, you think he's trying to take something from you. And what you don't realize, it's your crack talking, not you. So I'm really trying to get us to dig in to this whole emotional health that is required to be a happy and healthy person, not a couple. Because you do not become a happy couple if you don't have a happy person. I don't care how much money you got. Most of the people that got money are the most broken people you'll ever meet. And gifted doesn't mean broken. Because as we see in our culture, most of the gifted people we see are the most craziest people we've seen. 
vis-a-vis, I believe I can fly. I believe I can touch the sky. Think about it every night and day. But here's the thing. Your giftedness covers your brokenness. And you could think your giftedness is an excuse to cover your brokenness. And every one of us in this room are cracked in some capacity. The very important question is, is are you healthy? Some of you got affirmation issues and no one can work with you because you're so cracked. If we don't affirm you, you offend it. If we don't sit there and say, man, you did, Glover, you did such a good job. Well, you told Penny how she's saying, well, but you ain't tell me. You got affirmation issues. And it doesn't matter how much I applaud you. If I applaud you today, you'll feel like I didn't give you as much attention as I gave you last week because you're broken. And the worst thing to deal with in life is a male that doesn't have affirmation. Because they will kill other people just to get an applause that still won't feel their brokenness. And you can give them all the love you want. You can, you can mesmerize them all day and all night. And they'll still be unhappy because they're broken. It'll never be enough. And until we fix these cracks, we won't be no good to ourselves. We won't be no good to our kids. We won't be no good to humanity. And I know it's tough, but it's real. Some of us think that that's just the way we are. And now people got to deal with our dysfunction. So my hope today is that if your crack is unhealthy, that you'll say, Pastor D, I, you know what, I'm, I'm going to take a step and get me together. I'm going to take a step and get me together. Because I spent so much time, I oh, mean, I just, I'm single, I just need companionship. You need a therapist. Every year would feel, you'd wake up and you wouldn't feel the weight of the world on you because you got out of you what's in you. You know what happens? When you shake a soda bottle long enough, eventually it explodes. See, for some of you, you explode in places that are safe. But one day you're going to explode in a place it's not going to be safe. Crack glasses that feel they can conquer them. Man, I, nobody tried me. Listen, there's always a bigger bully. And you may be cracked and you, you explode on the interstate. Chasing people down and now you're getting shot and killed because you didn't fix your unhealthy spaces. And this ain't a run around, touch your neighbor, but it is a run around, think about it. It's hard to get people to stand you when you can't stand yourself. Worship is a process of getting into the presence and getting healing, but it's not the only process. Some of us need to be mature enough and say, listen, I grew up without a dad, I raised myself, and I'm doing well. But you're full of anger. And now your spouse has to be your father. And they got to fix the areas that dad, you need help. And I know we paint this picture in the world that, man, if, if you just get married and you twirl around on your first dance, it's going to make you. And then we, we're seeing a bunch of people at 65, 70 percent getting divorced. And they're saying, like, that didn't fix me. And everybody told me it would. Not 
so. I want to pray because all of us are cracked in some capacity. But the, the real question is, is are we healthy? Is are we healthy? Because you see, uh, you could be great and your dysfunction will eventually come and bleed on everybody. So I want to pray with you, with us, for you. And if you're here and you're married or you're separated or you're complicated or you're sleeping in separate beds like the old church used to do, they, get, they dress alike on Sunday and hate each other Monday through Friday. You're not weak for you. I don't let nobody in my business. That ain't no life to live. We just going to tolerate each other. We're, we're, we're about to hit the grave anyway. At least the few days you got left on the earth, you want to enjoy them. And here's where I want to conclude with if you're married. Karen, I'll borrow you because I can't borrow nobody else for this example. We'll be taking it on. So here's the thing. When we are in marriage, we need to be back to back. If you have my back and I have your back, we're okay. Our enemies are not each other. They're around us. When it goes bad, this is what happens. Well, not that. This is good. But this, this is what happens. That's sorry. This is what happens. When it goes bad, <laughs> I rebuke you, Satan. Get behind me. When it goes bad, it's when we think we're each other's enemy. And that's the worst thing to ever happen. Is to say this. Here's the thing. Two couples can genuinely, yeah, two couples can, two couples can genuinely love each other and fall totally out of love because they stopped fighting the world and started fighting each other. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we don't have the answers. Quite honestly, we don't know the way but you do.